Everybody loves getting updates for Terraria. That feeling of excitedly waiting for new and high quality content is something we never get tired of. At the time of this upload, Terraria has recently had its 11th birthday. Let that sink in for a second. This stupid little block game is older than most of you watching this. It's important to look back and see how the game got to where it is. The year is 2012. Terraria's 1.1 update was an absolute hit, and Relogic wanted to port their game to consoles. They went to Engine Software and asked them to make the console version. They agreed, but sometime into development, they asked themselves, what if we added our own stuff? And so they slapped a bunch of things together, and in 2013, presented the console version of the game. The exclusive content was cool and all, but something wasn't right. A lot of it seemed rushed and lazy. It didn't really fit the style of Terraria. Over the years, they did improve a lot of this stuff, but when it came to update the platform to 1.3, Relogic decided it would be best to erase the content from the face of the Earth. Today, I want to take a trip down memory lane and take a look at the content that wasn't meant to be. For fun, we'll also cover some things from mobile, because that version is another can of worms. It's hard to get your hands on the old-gen console stuff these days. To get the footage in this video, I'm using a mod called Consolaria. It adds a lot of the exclusive content back in, but makes some changes, so keep that in mind. The console version introduced new challenges to the game, and we'll get to those! In order to combat them, a few new weapons were added, the most famous of which being the Sharanga. It was a straight upgrade to the Molten Fury Bow, and even used two of them in its recipe. The Sharanga could do more damage, shoot faster, and convert arrows into more powerful spectral arrows. These shots had more than double the strength of regular arrows, and inflicted the target with Cursed Inferno. That doesn't seem too helpful, but remember, the Wall of Flesh isn't immune to being set on fire. If you put in the time and effort to get that extra hellstone, this weapon could carry you for the rest of pre-hard mode. When the console version was released, Terraria didn't have a lot of the features it has today. The game's progression stopped after the mech bosses, so there weren't things like Plantera or Golem yet. They added three unique items to serve as the game's final weapon upgrades. The Tizona was an improved Excalibur, and at the time, was better in every way. The main draw of this weapon was that it could dish out bleed damage against enemies. This wasn't anything special though, and was basically just a reskinned fire debuff. Think of this weapon as a faster, fiery greatsword. The Tomagiri was another melee weapon, but this one was an upgrade to the Gungnir. It was much faster than its hollowed counterpart, and could also poison enemies. It was a solid option in tight spaces. The last available weapon was the Vulcan Repeater. It was a better version of the Hollow Repeater, and had the gimmick of turning any arrows fired from it into Vulcan Bolts. These would explode on impact, similar to Hellfire arrows. Another weapon type console added was, oddly enough, pets. Six were added to the game, and some of them were able to attack things. Their strength varied, and most couldn't move that well. But they helped tag on a little extra damage, so it was nice keeping them around. These attacking pets actually predate the Summoner class. I'm not saying that Engine inspired Relogic to add minions, but it's interesting to think about and see how two different teams came up with similar ideas. All of these weapons are pretty cool, but pale in comparison with the best one available. If you ever need something extra dead, and don't care about destroying the world around you, try the Holy Hand Grenade. It has the highest base damage of any weapon in Terraria, and can one-shot all but the tankiest of players. It's stuffed with several sticks of dynamite, but it would be more effective to use each stick individually. Is it practical? No. Is it really funny? Yes. Accidentally throwing one of these inside your house is an experience every mobile player shares. We've talked about all these weapons so far. We should probably see what new threats you can use them on. Console added quite a few enemies to the game. A lot of them were just palette swaps of other existing enemies, like the spectral and shadow variants of hollowed and corrupt foes. Instead of going through all of them, I've picked out a few that had a big impact on the game, or I found interesting. Archdemons were an alternative to regular demons in the underworld. They were somewhat infamous for letting you sequence break the game. They dropped crystal shards, but this wasn't too useful. Almost every item that needed them required a hard mode crafting station. You could, however, make phase savers early. So I guess that's something. The crazy part was that Archdemons could give you the Crystal Storm Tome, a rapid-firing, hard-mode weapon. If you were lucky enough to find one, this item could shred the early game. 
Arch Wyverns are next, and these guys actually looked really cool. They were twice as powerful as a regular Wyvern, which is already a tough enemy. I'm bringing them up though because of their weird drop. I don't know why, but they had a 75% chance to drop a Shadow Key. Why such a specific number? At the stage of the game you fight this thing, you'd probably already have one. What was Engine Software thinking? That could also be asked of the Dragon Hornet. Compared to the other jungle enemies, these Hornets were much more powerful and could shrug off most attacks. The jungle is supposed to be a mid pre hard build area, and these enemies single-handedly ruined that balance. Players had no choice but to spend an eternity whittling them down. That now leaves us with the bosses. Console only added one, but the mobile version had two others. Everybody associates them with the old version of Terraria anyway, so we'll talk about them first. During the Easter season, bunnies would occasionally be replaced with aggressive diseaster bunnies. Kill one and use its egg to summon Lepus. This fight felt like a modified King Slime. It would hop around and try to stomp on the player. What made it special was that Lepus could lay eggs that would spawn either little minions or clones of itself. If you couldn't break them fast enough, things could get out of hand real quick. Lepus had three drops. The Egg Cannon, which was a really bad gun that hatched critters. The Boots of Astara, an armor piece that let you do a triple jump. And for whatever reason, a 1% chance to drop Souls of Might. Similar to the Archdemon and their Crystal Shards, you can't do anything with them at this stage of the game, so why even have it as a drop? There are so many little pieces of confusing design in these ports. The other mobile boss was Turkor. This disgusting looking thing was restricted for Thanksgiving. To summon it, you needed to buy a turkey pet from the merchant and find some cursed stuffing as a random drop from enemies. Using the stuffing while the turkey was out would mutate it into Turkor. This boss was unique and was like a Hydra. In order to hurt the body, you had to take out the heads, and after a little while, more heads would grow back. The longer you let the fight go on, the harder it got. Upon death, Turkor would drop an incredibly useful item, the Horn of Plenty. It was a healing item slightly weaker than greater healing potions, but had infinite uses. Good for saving resources. And now we get to the face of Console Terraria, the boss everybody thinks of when discussing these old versions. Okram. Back in the day, Terraria didn't have a final boss, so Okram was created kind of as a marketing gimmick to say that the console version had a final boss. To spawn it, you needed a suspicious skull made from a bunch of other items. The boss would hover around the player and occasionally shoot lasers while sending minions away. It would then charge at you in a fashion eerily similar to the Eye of Cthulhu. If it wasn't obvious, Okram borrowed a lot of its AI from other bosses. When Phase 2 began though, he got some new tricks, and oh boy, I hope you like projectile spam. Every time he moved, demon sides were left behind, and he also had this attack. If you managed to kill Ulcram, he would drop Souls of Blight. These were used to make those three endgame weapons, along with some new armor sets. These sets weren't flashy and didn't have unique abilities, but they did provide some pretty high stats, so they were good. What wasn't good, though, were their original sprites. They were recolors of other armor pieces and were laughably awful. Thankfully, they were touched up later, but the fact that this was allowed to exist in the first place cannot be forgiven. And that's it. That's about everything I wanted to talk about. I skipped over a few features, especially coming from mobile. There are things like potions that make you invincible, arrows that stun targets, and pets that generate money, but that's for a different time. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to board up my house to stop all the angry console fans. Hope you enjoyed.